All right, hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar on genealogy for the next generation a national family history curriculum. My name is Kathleen McKenzie, Education and Programming Manager here at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society, and I will be the moderator for today's session. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history, and we are Sorry, I had a frog in my throat there. And we are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Today, we are going to discuss our new family history curriculum that is available for free on our website. It is a first of its kind curriculum with ambitious goals to make genealogy accessible to all students and to empower educators to effectively teach it. Our presenter today is Dustin Axe, our Youth Genealogy Curriculum Coordinator. Dustin is a licensed social studies teacher with nearly 20 years of experience as an educator. He worked in a variety of settings, but he has spent most of his career as an educator working in museums, where he has developed field trips for students and created professional development workshops for educators. He especially enjoys it when teachers and students have aha moments where they can discover something new. Now, genealogy can be a challenging subject to teach and learn, but it can be extremely rewarding for students to learn about themselves, their family, and where they came from. Today, we will discuss challenges and why it can be difficult to teach young students how to do genealogy. And we will also share some of the opportunities and positive outcomes that can result if genealogy is taught carefully. We will then introduce our family history curriculum and give an overview of some of its key teaching strategies. We are here to support you in your journey to motivate and inspire the next generation of family historians. In addition to our new curriculum, we will share details on our teacher trainings and annual essay contests for students. At any point during today's session, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is no handout for this presentation, but we are recording this event and starting tomorrow, you can freely go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website. So if you missed something during the live session, don't worry, you can always review the presentation later. All right, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Dustin. Okay, uh, thank you, Kathleen, and greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Again, my name is Dustin, and today I want to begin with a fundamental question. How do you make genealogy accessible to all students? Now, this can be very challenging, particularly for educators working with a group of students. How do you differentiate lessons for every student in the class, each with unique backgrounds, each with different degrees of potential sensitivities when it comes to family, each with different amounts of information that may be available about their family. And then there's the question, how do you get students excited about genealogy and family history? Now, of course, these questions are of interest, not just for educators in a classroom or group setting, but for all of you out there who may be working with children in your family at home. So let's talk about this. We are first gonna begin by talking about some of the challenges that we're up against. And I wanna begin with a plausible scenario. I want you to imagine that there is an educator working with a group of elementary or middle school age students. This could be a classroom teacher, a scout troop leader, an educator working with a co-op of homeschool students. It's an educator working with a group of students. So the teacher introduces genealogy and says, today we are gonna research our family history. We're gonna build a family tree we're gonna fill out a multi-generational chart and we're gonna look for family members in the census. The teacher shows the class some of her own items, her own tree and chart, 
along with some other examples. The students all have computers, but keep in mind they have no experience doing genealogy in the past. Uh, and there are significantly more students than adults. So the teacher passes out blank trees and charts, helps them gain access to genealogical websites, and they get started. But after some time, the teacher notices that some of the kids have found family members in the census, but they needed direct help from the teacher each step of the way. And the students can't really read the census on their own. Meanwhile, the rest of the class doesn't seem to be doing anything at all. They did a quick search, uh, which didn't yield results or perhaps results that they can make sense of. So they're now not doing what they're supposed to do, and some of them even have their heads down. And there's one student who filled out a portion of her multi-generational chart. She filled in her mother, a pair of her grandparents, a few of her great-grandparents. But for her father's line, she scribbled out that entire portion of her chart with a pen so much that it actually tears the paper. So we can imagine through this scenario that the teacher began with very good intentions, but the lesson led to some bad outcomes or to some certainly unintended outcomes. Most of the students weren't able to find family members in the census or complete their charts on their own. The students that did complete some of their trees and charts required direct adult attention, which means this wasn't student-centered, and at least one student appeared to become emotionally upset. So clearly there are some challenges here. Let's talk about some of them. Let's first start from the student's perspective. So some students will have a painful history and researching their family history can cause them to relive very negative family interactions. Doing genealogy could in fact decrease a student's self-esteem and open emotional wounds. Again, especially if they've had very negative experiences. Uh, and another challenge is many students may immediately encounter brick walls in their research. They may have limited or no known family history. So a brick wall is an apparent dead end where it's difficult or even impossible to locate new information. And as you know, this can be hard even for adults. And when students do locate information, there is a potential that they may discover a previously unknown piece of information about themselves or a family member that creates moral dilemmas that they may not be prepared to address at their at their age. So that's from the student's perspective. Now let's think about this from the teacher's perspective. And here I'm specifically talking about classroom teachers. One of the most significant barriers for anything in the classroom is the lack of time. Every minute of the day is precious. There are barely enough hours in the day for teachers to accomplish everything that is, that is expected of them. This can make it difficult to fit genealogy into their existing curricula. With the emphasis on English language arts and math, there is just simply an instructional time crunch for social studies. This means niche topics within social studies, such as genealogy, can be pushed to the margins. There is simply a gap here. And another challenge is that teachers may be unfamiliar with genealogical content, sources, and the research process, and therefore they may not have confidence in their teaching strategies when it comes to covering such a challenging and potentially upsetting subject. Research Indeed, and many of you may anecdotally know this, but research does indicate that there is less instructional, there, well, there's less time for social studies during the school day compared to other subjects. There is less teacher evaluation for social studies. There's less learning, uh, professional learning opportunities for social studies. So there's generally less guidance for 
teaching social studies. And therefore, teachers can be left cobbling together materials and doing it themselves. And my anecdotal experience with genealogy and working with teachers is that genealogy in depth is also often done by a self-selected group of teachers who have researched their own family, who know the process, who are comfortable bringing their enthusiasm for the subject into the classroom. They're familiar with the research process and sources, and they know how to break it down into manageable sections for students. Otherwise, teachers who have no experience with genealogy, who don't have time for it, and if it's not directly in their curricula, then it may not get done. More challenges include uh, misconceptions that students may be coming in with or ones they can develop by doing activities. And misconceptions can affect their basic beliefs and attitudes about not only genealogy, but history in general. And this is true for any, when you're working with any subject, the, the, the beliefs and attitudes that you form at a young age can stay with you for a really long time. So here's a few for genealogy. Generally, most students have a narrow perception of what genealogy entails. So they know it involves DNA tests, finding long lost relatives, building family trees, but they're generally unaware of how to do genealogy as a formal discipline of inquiry or why you would do it. Genealogy only involves searching for records online and building trees. These are, of course, important parts of genealogy, but they're not all of it. And genealogy is easy and everything is online. So this is common even for adults. Students may do a quick internet search, but if it doesn't yield results, then they may grow frustrated and stop. Maybe they say or think something like, well, if information isn't online, then it doesn't exist. And here's a few more. Genealogy is about getting as far back as possible, as fast as possible. So here students might say, well, I, I can't find ancestors from long ago, so genealogy is not for me. Or I didn't find information immediately, so it must not exist. All discovered information is true. And this can be true even for adults because we are inundated with so much information every single day. It's, it's just simply hard to distinguish what is true versus what isn't true sometimes. And students especially have trouble with this. They have trouble evaluating, verifying sources. And so when they do find information about themselves or their family members, they might say, okay, well, I found what I'm looking for. It must be true, so I can, I can stop there. And they may also believe that there is nothing to learn from their family history. This is also a really big one. So students might say, okay, well, you know, I'm not related to someone famous. I'm not related to some historic figure. So what's the point? What can I learn from this? Now, these are misconceptions that students have, and you're probably thinking, well, many adults also have these misconceptions. Well, they start somewhere. And if teachers hold some of these misconceptions as well, then that can make it even harder for them to teach genealogy with students. All right. So those were some of the challenges. And as we discovered with the plausible scenario, it's very easy to begin with good intentions, but we can end up doing something that may be unwise and even counterproductive, especially when considering all of these challenges. But the good news is that it doesn't have to be this way. There are opportunities for positive outcomes. So let's talk through some of these. First of all, we can build on the fact that students are natural family historians. They love to ask questions, listen to stories. 
They're natural storytellers. They love to explore who they are, discover their place in the world. So there's an opportunity to create student-centered lessons that allow them to make personal connections to history. It can empower students to create historical narratives for themselves and about themselves. Many students at home have heard family stories. They've looked at old photographs and heirlooms. So there's a natural curiosity there. And by tapping into that natural curiosity, there's an opportunity to help students develop research and thinking skills. Genealogy puts students at the center of doing history. And I wanna emphasize doing. Here, I'm talking about allowing history to become a verb. It's something you do. It's an action word. Students shouldn't be passively reading history or listening to lectures. Just as when you learn science, you learn science by doing science. You can learn history by doing history. And by having students do activities where they explore their roots and they're creating historical narratives for themselves, they can begin to develop critical skills. And those skills are what transfer or what can transfer to other aspects of life. And, and this is important. I want to emphasize this. Even if they never do genealogy ever again, developing critical skills and learning how to think historically is something that students can use for the rest of their lives. And also, I want to be clear that students can develop skills without researching their own family. They can do case studies. They can research another person's family, a neighbor, a teacher. So this should not depend on a student's specific background or history. There's also an opportunity to use inquiry-based lessons and primary sources to teach literacy and social studies content. So here, I mean, there's an opportunity to create student-centered activities that have students go through an inquiry process outlined in the C3 framework for social studies standards where students are creating their own questions, planning their own investigations, analyzing and evaluating sources, drawing conclusions, supporting claims with evidence. So, so students can go through this process of inquiry by investigating their own history and using primary sources from case studies of historic people. And all of this then can be a vehicle to teach literacy and content of specific topics in social studies, such as culture, geography, immigration, state history. So in other words, you can, you can cover content knowledge through the lens of doing genealogy. So students aren't just passive recipients of content. They're not just memorizing things, they're interacting with it. What better way to have students engage with content knowledge than by putting them at the center of that? There's also an opportunity to make real world connections that expose students to careers and authentic practices. So there's an opportunity to identify careers such as genealogists, archivists, historians, librarians, and even forensic scientists, and to replicate the process and behaviors they use in their daily work in an age-appropriate, student-friendly way to help them develop practices and a habit of mind that transfer to the real world. So again, students aren't just learning social studies content. They're doing the work of historians. And ideally, this is done in a way that is hands-on and fun, so students are inspired to continue doing into the future. And just as with science, you don't have to be a professional scientist working in a lab coat in a faraway place to do science. You don't have to be a professional genealogist to do genealogy. You can learn the steps they follow, develop their practices, and you can become an amateur genealogist and learn how to think like a genealogist, learn how to think like a historian. And again, that is what will transfer to other aspects of their life. 
Another opportunity here is or are the psychological and emotional benefits for students who do genealogy. Marshall Duke, a professor emeritus of psychology from Emory University, among others, found that students who do genealogy have a higher internal locus of control, higher self-esteem, and lower levels of anxiety. However, it's important to realize here that studies find a correlation among students that know their family history and among students who are well-adjusted. But a correlation does not mean causation. So just because a student knows the details of their family history does not guarantee they're gonna be well-adjusted. The positive outcomes can emerge in students, not from knowing the details of their family history, but from the process of learning those details. In other words, these outcomes can emerge when students do genealogy. And the heart of that comes in the form of communication when families share stories again and again and again, especially when there are multiple generations, multiple generations of family members that gather for things like meals, holidays, family celebrations, when family members are sharing stories. And of course, not every student will have a cohesive family that comes together in this way. So the emotional benefits by doing genealogy are not guaranteed in every circumstance. This is why genealogy has to be done very carefully. And research shows that there is affirmation for older generations who pass down their passion for genealogy. By, there's affirmation when passing down research skills, family stories, photographs, heirlooms, and even values, wisdom, lessons from the past. And this may describe a number of you out there who see the value of genealogy. It's simply affirming to know that younger generations will be the new caretakers and historians for your family. All right, so that was a lot, and I like to summarize. Maybe that's the teacher in me, um, but here's a summary of some of the opportunities. Students are natural family historians, and tapping into their curiosity provides an opportunity to help them develop research skills and thinking skills. And to develop those skills, there's an opportunity to use student-centered, inquiry-based lesson plans and primary sources to teach not only literacy, but all kinds of social studies content. There is an opportunity to, to expose students to careers in the humanities and to make connections to their authentic practices, habits of mind, skills that are used in the real world. There can be psychological and emotional benefits for students who do genealogy in the form of you know, sharing and listening to stories. Uh, but again, this is not guaranteed, so we have to be careful and very deliberate in our approach. And finally, it's affirming for older generations who pass down their passion for genealogy, their stories, objects, photographs to, to younger generations. All right, so keeping in mind the challenges and opportunities that we've discussed, we here at NEHGS have researched and developed a comprehensive set of lessons and strategies that you can try with your students. Today, I'm going to give an overview of the teaching strategies and talk through the general outline of the curriculum. But as I go through this, keep in mind that there is no universal approach to teaching any subject that is guaranteed to work for all students in every situation. So I'm gonna offer numerous strategies, but I want you to think about how this will work for you and your students based off you know, their age, grade, prior knowledge, the number of students you're working with, the amount of time you have, uh, the social studies content or standards that you're working with. So again, I'm gonna present some ideas, talk through the outline and the conceptual framework of our curriculum, but ultimately 
be creative and experiment with what works best for you. So this brings us right back to our original question. How do you make genealogy accessible to all students? And this can be broken down into two essential questions. What do you do when a student immediately encounters brick walls? And what do you do when a student does not want to do genealogy because family is a sensitive topic? So essentially, what do you do when a student seemingly can't do personal research and if they don't want to? And again, these questions are compounded when there is one educator and multiple students, each with unique backgrounds. And our teaching strategies for this fall under really three key principles. Key principle number one, foster an environment where students feel comfortable researching their family history. Do not pressure students. Make it clear that they are under no obligation to share anything they do not wish to share. In fact, let students define family for themselves. They should be allowed to research anyone they consider part of their family. The first lesson that we have, in fact, entitled Getting Started, can help you facilitate a discussion with students to have them to create an open-ended definition of family that works for everyone in the class, that embraces any type of family configuration. Basically, put it into their hands to create a definition of family that works for everybody. Get to know your students. So, and again, this is this works not just for genealogy, but really if you're working with any sensitive, potentially controversial topic in the classroom or with, with students, um, get to know them, build rapport and trust with your students by learning their background, their experiences as individuals. This will allow you to anticipate and then to navigate any moral dilemmas that may arise. And then you can better differentiate lessons based on who your students are. Now, if there isn't time to get to know them because you, let's say you are creating a field trip for a museum, a genealogy society, or a library, try to take a few minutes just to do an icebreaker at the beginning of your program, say, for example. This can help you build a little bit of trust. They can get to know you. You can get to know them. That's all about like helping foster this, this environment. Also, inform parents and guardians. Bring them on as partners as you do this with students. Inform them of the types of activities you will have students do, the types of questions that students may come home and ask, and don't just inform parents and guardians of what's taking place, let them know how they can help, that they can answer questions, share stories, provide details, and in our curriculum, we have a sample letter that you can edit and make, make changes to tailor for yourself and use it as a template to send home with, with students for this. All right, key principle number two, focus on the research process and help students develop skills. Notice what I didn't say here. I didn't say focus on the specific details of their history. The goal is for students, excuse me, the goal isn't for students to research their personal family history. The goal is for them to develop the skills in order to do so. Developing skills should not depend on who the students are or what their background is. Students who, you know, seemingly can't do research because they have limited access to information or if they don't want to do research because of painful history or they're afraid of encountering a moral dilemma, they can still develop skills. They can still do genealogy using case studies, researching another person such as a, a neighbor or a teacher. So learning the steps of the process and developing practices that historians and genealogists use this should be available to everyone, regardless of their background. So when I talk to, when I meet with teachers and talk with them, I advise teachers to 
not assess students on the content of their family history. A student should not be judged favorably, for example, because they can trace their family to the Mayflower or to royalty as opposed to a student who can't. So I recommend to not assess students on the quote unquote quality of their family history or the quantity. You know, many students may not have access to a lot of information from their past or they just may not want to share it. Instead, assess them on their skills, their research process, their creativity, their interpretation, the, 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 the generation of questions, how they evaluate sources and so forth. So given this principle of focusing on the research process and skills, we have structured our lessons around a student-friendly genealogy research process. And there, here are the steps. What do you know? What do you want to learn? How can you find out? Research and document. And what does it mean? Now, this can be used to guide students through not only researching their own family history, but also for using case studies. In fact, it's helpful to have them go through this process again and again and repeating the steps. So eventually they, they understand how to think like a historian and they're, they're developing that, that habit of mind. So this mimics an authentic process used by professionals. In fact, it's based off of the steps in our getting started guide that we give to adults. And it emphasizes a couple things. So it emphasizes the importance of formal procedures in genealogy, that this is a serious topic and there are steps and there's rules, and there's procedures that you follow. You can see there are five steps, not too dissimilar to the scientific method or an engineering design cycle. It can be powering for students to know they are replicating the same process that experts use, that you don't have to be a genealogist in a faraway place to do this. You can follow the same steps and use the same practices. So it offers a set of student-friendly steps that experts follow, and you can use this to emphasize creativity and interpretation. You can tell students that while everyone is, use, is using this process, everyone's doing the same process, each step can be personalized based on your unique history. Each step will lead to unique questions, unique sources and claims for every individual. This puts the students at the center of doing this process. So they are creating their own questions they're, they're planning out and, and, and carrying out their own investigation. This ideally empowers them with individual choices and agency. And this also gives you a tool to assess students on their research process. It has a clear beginning, middle, and end. And in just a minute, I will share how our lessons use this process, uh, but I want you to think how you might use it as well. All right, key principle three, encourage students to begin their research at home. Our lessons, in fact, are structured around this basic principle. And here I'm talking about when students are doing their own, the research of their personal lives. This is what I've been calling dinner table genealogy. It sets students up for success by first having them interview people they know best and by looking for simple items around the house including records, photographs, and heirlooms. And we have lesson plans for each one of these sources. This allows students to begin at home, to start with what is familiar and, do, and to then work towards the unfamiliar. And this makes the entire process of finding sources be easier. So students aren't in immediately encountering brick walls. They're simply going home, they're looking for sources around the house. Again, family records, photographs, objects, and each of these sources are, should be broadly defined so students can identify and locate them quickly. And if they don't have a particular item, that's okay. They can move on, look for something different. Let, let them choose and kind of um, tailor what they're looking for on their own. They can look for photographs hanging on the wall or if a student doesn't have an heirloom 
that's been passed down for generations. They can look for a new gift that they just received on their birthday or something, or maybe there's a knickknack on the shelf. What is ultimately important, and this is what you can emphasize with student, is the people, the memories, the stories, and the questions associated with the item, not necessarily how old it is or how expensive it is or anything like that. So dinner table genealogy, this is an authentic first step for any beginning researcher. And essentially it's a more accessible introduction <clears throat> than paper trail genealogy that emphasizes family trees, records, multi-generational charts. So let's take a look at this, <clears throat> excuse me. Just as in our plausible scenario, it's it's just so easy to set students free on the computer. You know, the wild, wild west, <clears throat> but uh, the wild, wild west of Google or doing internet searches, but th there, are, there are some drawbacks to that. So first of all, barriers because of technologies, because of technology can prevent students from accessing family history websites and online searches present multiple challenges what to search, where to search, how to search. You may get thousands of results. Uh, for those of you that are experienced genealogists, you know this. This can be hard for adults. It can be hard for students. And they may have limited or no records. So many, if not most, students in a class may only find a few records or none at all. And young students will then need direct attention to access them, which means the process of finding them is not student-centered. And if they do find something, reading and interpreting primary source documents can be challenging for anyone. So all of this then makes it hard to differentiate lessons based on who the students are. So if you're an educator working with a group of students, what do you do if a few students are having success finding things while the rest of the class is struggling. And also remember, you're outnumbered. There's only one of you or maybe a few volunteers or you have a few assistants, but there's many more students. That makes it very hard. And also having students begin with records online can create and reinforce misconceptions. Some of the misconceptions that we, we talked about, that everything is online, that if it's online, it doesn't exist, which can create a, a narrow perception of genealogy. Dinner table genealogy, on the other hand, here's a list of, of some of its characteristics. Emphasizes oral history by having students interview people they know. This can tap into emotional benefits from that process of communication. And again, this makes it easier to find sources. So students aren't immediately encountering brick walls. They're simply going home, looking for sources around the house and talking to people about them. And, find, and finding sources quickly then leaves more time to emphasize the entire research process. So students aren't just getting hung up looking for sources. Try to create a broad conception of what genealogy is. And remember, students, students at a young age, they're not putting together a large, sophisticated history with volumes of evidence. They're creating something that's age appropriate, a snapshot. Perhaps it's of a single event or a person or an object and uh, you know that means something to them or they're looking for a personal connection to a specific topic or theme and history so again it's a matter of helping them achieve something that is age appropriate all right so to summarize here are key principles and teaching strategies that we've built our lessons on uh, but think how you might use these. Again, uh, principle one, foster an environment where students feel comfortable researching their family history. Don't pressure them. Let them research who they want. Build rapport, trust. Key principle two, focus on the research process and help students develop skills. This should not depend on their specific history or even researching their own family. Three, encourage students to begin their research at home. This is an easy starting point for 
students to begin uh, with what is familiar and to work towards the unfamiliar. And it focuses on oral history. Now, all of these strategies are laid out in the content and accessibility sections of our curriculum. Uh, but again, as, I, as I've said, I want you to, to, I encourage you to be creative and to think what will work best for you. And in your journey to create genealogy activities and lessons, if you're like me, there will be moments when you're really overwhelmed, when you realize how challenging this can be, because you want to make genealogy accessible and fun, but know there are practical steps you can take and strategies you can implement, and we're here to support you. We have a family history curriculum on our website. It's for free, and you can download everything immediately. The objectives are to empower students to develop, develop critical research and thinking skills, and regardless of their background and family configuration. And we hope to empower teachers to effectively teach genealogy to all students and to inspire the next generation of family historians. Now, our lessons target grades four to six, but some of the things I've, well, a lot about what I talked through today, strategies, definitions, and the overall inquiry arc of the lessons that we have that can be used as a framework for any grade, not just four for six. So think about, again, how you can adapt it. And also any setting, you know, everything here is available, not just for classroom teachers, but we encourage those of you in informal settings to take a look. After school programs, homeschool educators, librarians, or if you're just working with your grandchildren at home. We use the C3 framework and the understanding by design or backwards design curriculum planning tools to help us develop everything. You can download all the lessons together or you can access them lesson by lesson and you can tailor them for your own students. So you can, you can uh, upload them through Google Docs and uh, tailor them, change them how you want. All of this can be as easy as printing off our student worksheets for the children and your family and working with them at home. Or you can scale everything up and do it all in detail. It really just depends. And quickly, I wanna talk through our lesson plan sequence. All of our lessons are based on the strategies that I talked about today and the inquiry arc from our genealogy research process. The first lesson covers the first three steps of the process. This is basically the planning steps of the process, which students uh, are generating questions, which by the way, is the driving force of all of inquiry. And they are planning their research by essentially identifying who they wanna talk to and where they wanna look. Then there are lessons on five sources, interviews, photographs, heirlooms, family records, and meaningful places. The lessons walk students through the process of analyzing and evaluating each source with observations, inferences, and questions. And there's a lesson entitled, What Does It Mean? Final Project. This can be used to help you plan what you would like them to do with their sources, how they can make sense of it. And finally, we have a lesson that provides tips for using case studies. Please know that we are working to add more case studies and none of this is a finished product. Uh, so please know that, but there's a lesson that you can use as a tool to help you use what we have and to even create your own. You can use case studies to introduce genealogy to students at the beginning to, to introduce the skills and to let them practice. And then you can also use case studies at the end as an assessment tool. And you can also use it as an alternative for students who do not want to research their own, their own family history. We have full case studies of historic figures and a couple well curated mini case studies. But again, we're working to add more. We are also here to support you uh, with free teacher trainings. 
There are, these are available for K through 12 formal and informal educators. These are for uh, one-on-one or small group Zoom meetings with me. We can meet, I can help you brainstorm a personalized plan to teach genealogy. I have a background working mostly in museum education. I've worked with different ages, different abilities, uh, wide range of programs with students, including homeschool students. So I can help you brainstorm many different types of programs. Uh, and again, these are free. You can register on the same page where you, where you access the curriculum. And we, I would like to plug our annual essay contest. This has cash prizes. This is available for students in grades four to 12, uh, public, private, and homeschool students. Now I should say the deadline for our 2023 contest is coming up in, on April 1st. Um, so if you know any teachers or students, please let them know. If you're watching a recording of this, know that, you know, if you're watching a recording of this after the deadline, know that this is an annual contest and uh, it'll start each year in November. And I would like to say that I really appreciate any feedback that anyone has in the form of questions, comments, suggestions. If you do any of the lessons or implement any of the strategies, we would love to hear from you. We are gathering testimonies. What did you do? What worked? What didn't work? Uh, you are our eyes and ears for helping us make improvements because in the end, you're the ones doing this and you are how the rubber meets the road. And we would like to hear from you. All right, thank you so much, Dustin. Um, this is such a great curriculum and uh, it was wonderful to kind of hear you share more about um, the processes and strategies involved in that. Um, so now we wanna hear from all of you out there. Um, so we've already had some questions coming in, but please do feel free to continue submitting questions um, through the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen and we will be happy to get to those. Um, so first off, Dustin, um, I wanted to ask, because we had a few people ask questions along this line, um, they were wondering what you think about having students uh, research the genealogy of a celebrity. Um, is that something you have thoughts on or that's uh, been addressed in the curriculum at all? Of a celebrity, that's a good question. So here's, here's what I would recommend. So at a, th there's different levels of inquiry. I would think about where you start them at to have them start on the open-ended inquiry, doing third person research for someone online is gonna be very difficult. What I would do is do the research in advance, find the sources and provide the sources to the students. So you're curating all of their records. And, and, and then let them come up with their own questions, let them kind of come up with their own story. They can maybe create a timeline, a map, kind of interpret it. But so you want that process of finding the sources to be easy, tear that down, provide them with the sources. And then as they develop skills and practice, then the next step of inquiry might be, okay, so let's say you're doing a celebrity or a historic figure. Maybe you're providing them with a couple of their records as a launching point, maybe like a birth certificate. And then you say, as you, as you can see, here's the parents, here's the grades, here's the or the grades, the the whatever it may be as a launching point. And then you could say, okay, well, let's go over here and now let's try to find some additional records. That would be like a step two. And then step three would be, okay, create your own questions, identify your own, the own records, try to find them, you know, like a complete, complete open-ended. So, so think about different levels of inquiry and actually the case studies lesson that I have, the, the last lesson kind of talks you through how you, how you might do that. That's a good question. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, so then we have a question here um, who is asking, uh, you know, you talked about a lot of these challenges and a lot of them would be um, perhaps more specific to elementary school age children, which of course is what this curriculum is developed for, um, grades four through six. Um, maybe you could talk a bit about why that age group was chosen. Oh, okay. That's a fantastic question. So, so again, the, 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 the strategies are pretty general. You, 
hopefully you can run with those and really use those to apply for any grade level, especially, okay, so like, let's say K through three, you know, thinking about, all right, so I want to do dinner table genealogy. And you want, so you want students to start with what is familiar and work towards the unfamiliar. Well, that's that same, that, that same principle applies. So you're, they're, they're conducting interviews, have them look at photographs that relate to their lives. So maybe they're looking at historic photos, but the historic photos have children in it. So they're identifying what they know and maybe and they're looking at families in it. But then as they look closer, they're seeing what they don't know. So then, oh, so they, they, they're building, you know, they're identifying what they see and then they're developing questions. And then, and then you can say, okay, well, how would we plan our investigation? Where would we look for those answers, right? It's, it's just the same thing for um, fourth through sixth grade, exact same process. Um, so why, why we started that grade level? That's a really, that's a really good question. You know, in general, my general sense is that this is a, there is a gap here in schools and in, in, in communities and families for teaching genealogy because it's such a difficult subject. So our job as informal educators is to help fill a gap. So we started here and hopefully we're, we're, we're offering something that can apply to a lot of people and uh, so they can really tailor it for, for, you know, their neck of the woods. Definitely. Great. Thank you so much, Dustin. Um, all right. Now we have a question here um, about the essay contest that you mentioned. Um, so Margaret is wondering if there are any past winner submissions that they can read or see. Ooh, that is a great question. We did our first essay contest in 2020. That was open to Massachusetts students only. And if you go to our essay contest page now, it is, you'll see now that it's national. So it's for students across the entire country and about midway through that page, there is a link that you can click on previous winners and you can see all the winning essays. You can see a picture of all the winners. They're holding up their certificate and there's a PDF with their, with their essays. Now, please understand <laughs> that, that first contest, it was a different question. And actually, those students could pick from three different questions. So, and we have new judging criteria. It's a little bit different now, uh, but yes, that that you can see the old winner, you can see the the previous winners, and um, to get an idea of kind of what we do. All right, great. Um, and then let's see here. We have a question, um, a bit of a tricky question of how would you recommend responding to parental objections to this instructional area? Okay, well, okay, great question. I would absolutely, you know, lean on the principle of do you, you don't want to pressure students if they don't want to do something or if their, their parents or guardians don't want to do the, do something that is, that is certainly fine. One thing you could think of is try separating, try to think of it as you're separating genealogy from family history. So if the student doesn't want to do their personal family history, that's okay. You can still have them do genealogy. They can use case studies. They can research you know, your family, the, the teacher's family history, a neighbor, a friend, someone else's, um, right? So again, it, regardless of who they are, what their background is, what their, you know, any sensitive topics, moral dilemmas, as an educator, your job is just to help them develop the skills and to ultimately plant seeds. So, you know, if that parent or guardian or that student, there's 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 a sensitive topic there. So right now, it's not appropriate for that student, maybe at their age level, their maturity level. But if you plant seeds and you're teaching kids how to think historically, trying to think like a genealogist, and they know how to identify sources, create a plan, create questions, you know, even if they're not finding answers, that's okay. They kind of know this process. One day when they're older, more mature, they can then do it on their own. They, they, they can maybe start to address some of those issues. And, and the same is true for students who may be adopted. You know, if, if students want to research their foster family, fantastic. That might be an opportunity for them to um, get, get to know them better, for the family to deliberately share stories. They can record them together. But then again, at the same time, if they don't want to, 
If they don't want to research their biological family, that's okay too. Your job as the educator is to not judge, just help them uh, learn the skills and the, 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 the process. Great. Thank you so much, Dustin. And um, actually, as you were answering that question, I was reading through um, some of the other questions and comments that have come in. Um, and we had a great comment here um, from someone, Margaret, um, who did mention that she's implemented some of these lessons in her classroom. Um, and in her experience, she's found that family members usually become much more forthcoming and comfortable mm -hmm. with teaching family history in the classroom um, when this when they kind of can see what the student is working on and see the process. Um, so that definitely touches on what, what you've spoken about, about kind of keeping the parents informed and involved. Um, and that's great to see that, mm -hmm. that that's worked for you, Margaret. So thank you for sharing. Yes. All right. Um, so then, um, you know, I, I know you've talked a lot about some of the challenges involved. Um, what would you recommend if um, a student was adopted, for example? Um, how, how would you recommend someone address that? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, that is a good question. One of the most common questions I get. And again, that goes back to the original question, how do you make genealogy accessible to all students? I would keep some of the really big key principles that I, I talked about in mind. Foster an environment where students feel comfortable. Don't pressure them. Let them define family any way they want. If this includes their biological or foster family, that's great. Um, stress that families come in many different forms. No, no family is better than another. And build rapport, get to know them. And again, it's hard to give a quick answer for something like this because there's no universal approach. Essentially, you know, you want to be very flexible and be ready to adapt to who your students are. That's what it means to be student centered. So, and like I was saying before, ultimately it's about planting seeds. So if they're doing their own family history, great. If they're doing other people's family history, that's great too. Your job as the educator is to, you know, help them develop skills as long as they're not creating as long as you're not creating misconceptions or turning them off to doing genealogy there maybe one day they can research um their biological family or anyone they you know they want they don't have to it's again your job as the educator is just to be as, as objective as universal as as possible all right thanks so much dustin um, so let's see, we've got another question here, um, wondering if everything involved in the curriculum, um, you know, different handouts and materials, things like that, um, is all of that free or just some of it? Yes, everything in the curriculum is free. The Google Slides presentations, the student worksheets, lesson plans, case studies, none of this is a finished product, um, and, and, but all of it is available for, for free because of our members and donors and all of their ongoing support. So thank you to everyone out there. Uh, in closing, I know we have just like a minute, but when I step back and I look at the big picture, social studies education is more important than ever. And our role as informal educators is to fill a gap that exists in schools, communities, and as I said, even in families. Uh, <clears throat> If you Google genealogy, you can you will find literally hundreds, thousands of activities, but there aren't too many comprehensive family history curricula out there with lessons and strategies all in one place, um, at least that I've found. So we're trying to fill a gap, a need, and we have a long way to go, and we're trying. So yes, everything is free, and thank you to everyone for their ongoing support. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Dustin. As you mentioned, we are running up against the clock here, so I think that's probably a perfect place to leave it. Um, but if we didn't get to any of your questions, or if you do think of one later, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you can email us at education at nehgs.org um, or to Dustin's email directly, which he shared earlier as well, um, and we will be happy to help. Um, also, as Dustin mentioned, if you have um, implemented any parts of the curriculum, done any, any of the activities in your classroom or um, whatever setting it may be, please do reach out. We would love to hear from you.
Um, if you do perhaps have a genealogical question, you can access our free Ask a Genealogist chat service at AmericanAncestors.org slash chat Tuesday through Saturday from 9 to 5 with extended hours on Wednesdays until 8 p.m. And this service is free and open to the public. All right, thank you everybody for joining us. As you do leave this event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more free programs in the future. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org. All right, I hope to see you all at future online programs in the future, and goodbye for now.